Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new semester of Social Work 206. This is the introduction to social work. My name is Bill Gaelic, and I'll be very pleased to be the person to lead you through this material for the semester. I will spend a little bit of time telling you a little bit about myself just so that you know why it is that I'm the person that's here uh, teaching this information uh, and uh, uh, giving you a little bit of ideas, some of my experiences that might help you understand um, how it is that I approach this particular topic. Um, I have this, this may be the first course. It's, this is either this course or 106 was the first course that I taught for the University of Alaska system back in the late 1980s or very early 1990s at Kenai Peninsula College. And this is one of those courses that I have been teaching pretty continuously in all the years since then. I have been working as an adjunct instructor with the university first at Kenai Peninsula College in the classroom and more recently for the uh, Anchorage campus uh, at the School of Social Work and more and more online now exclusively online in fact um, uh, really for almost 70 semesters now I guess I've been teaching and uh, as of the uh, spring of 2019 now I am actually an assistant professor of social work uh, for the for the School of Social Work at the University of Alaska Anchorage, I'm happy to say. Um, I bring about 40 some years experience in social work uh, to, to this course and, and want to share a little bit about what my experiences were uh, during the course of that uh, during the course of that career I graduated with a bachelor's in social work at Michigan State in 1974 and then uh, gained a master's in social work at Florida State University in 1983 so I had about eight years of, of practice before I went back for my master's degree it is something that I actually recommend to those of you who might be considering uh, getting a social work degree and then going on to get an MSW is to get out and work for a few years for a number of different reasons one of which is it's a good idea to be exposed to the realities of practice. Also because when you go back for your master's training, you're going to have a little bit better idea of what it is that you want to learn uh, more about and what you want to become better at. Uh, and we'll also have uh, some real good practical experience that will make the studies much more meaningful, I think, on the graduate school level if you do that. Not to say you can't go directly into grad school from undergrad, but uh, I found personally uh, that those years of, of practice in between the two educational experiences is something that's very valuable to me. My my career, uh, the first couple of years out of out of MSU, I worked in public assistance programs in Florida. Uh, first for the what was then called the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and the food stamp programs. These are now ATAP and SNAP, or uh, TANF and SNAP, depending upon where you are in the United States. And then uh, spent about four years after that experience, about four years working, uh, carrying a child protection caseload in Central Florida. Another seven years or so working in, in a residential care and treatment program in Orlando called Great Oaks Village. And this was a, a, a facility that housed children who were removed from their homes and were either waiting for uh, a foster home to open up for them uh, or who were placed there for behavior treatment because of uh, issues of what was then called ungovernability. Um, they were, children were actually taken to court by their parents because the parents couldn't control them. And, and we worked in a behavior treatment program trying to help them uh, learn better patterns of behavior as well as helping the parents learn better ways to, to uh, respond to their children, to their teenagers. Uh, that uh, facility, when I left there, uh, had 128 beds. It's just, uh, since expanded into two or three more campuses around the county and, and it's really uh, become quite the feather in the cap of the uh, uh, Orange County, Florida commissioners uh, taking care of their dependent children very well. But we, we implemented a lot of different programs, both in terms of helping kids while they were in temporary shelter with us, as well as in servicing those children who 
uh, were likely to age out of the foster care system because foster homes for teenagers were in such so short supply. We, we uh, provided them with some programs that tried to normalize their ad adolescent experience in group living, which is a difficult thing to do, um, and, and also to give them an opportunity to learn some independent living skills before they went out on their own, which is another area that, that uh, kids who age out of foster care often have problems with because, you know, we, we all learn from our parents how to, you know, you know manage a bank account and you know and uh, do our laundry and do the cooking and do the shopping and things like this whereas kids in foster care often don't learn that and uh, this so we helped them we, we were helping these kids trying to trying to learn those basic life skills so they have better chance of success when they went out into the community in any event during that period of time while I was working at Great Oaks I went off to get my master's program and came back and when I came back I was supervising the counselors in all the different programs on that campus uh, for a number of years. I moved to Alaska in 1987 and worked uh, for about seven or eight years as an outpatient mental health therapist with the Mental Health Center in Kenai, which was then called Central Peninsula Counseling Services. I think now it's uh, PCHS, and I forget what exactly that stands for. Um, and then moved over to work, start working for the state again, went back to, I said it was a little bit like coming home. Uh, I went back to working in child protection and supervised the child protection, uh, actually all of the services on the Kenai Peninsula for the first several years, everything from the taking of the initial report all the way through to the uh, adoption of some of those children who couldn't be returned home. Uh, but focused uh, in the later years of my employment there on uh, on uh, intake and investigations uh, of, of uh, reports of concern regarding uh, possible child abuse and neglect for the last several years there. And then I retired from the state of Alaska after uh, 19 years working for the state there. Um, and um, uh, within the year moved back to the lower 48. I now live in Northeast Indiana and uh, I'm, uh, well, I, I've told everybody I'm in a ret state of retirement, but the fact is is that I've pretty much come out of retirement now since I'm on the faculty of the university, and I have a, a pretty big teaching load, as a matter of fact. All of this is online, of course, so uh, so although I'm four hours ahead of you, um, in, 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 uh, in temporal time, I'm right with you otherwise, and so... Um, I hope that you'll find, and so far it's worked out fine over the last three or four years. My students can access me uh, very easily through telephone, FaceTime, email, all those kinds of things as you need to. We, uh, I do have office hours established uh, on Monday mornings, uh, and um, you'll see the, the hours in the syllabus. If, But you don't need to restrict yourself to those hours to contact me. However, I, I will try my best to make sure I'm available during those hours. If you want to have a face-to-face -face over the computer, like through FaceTime or something along those lines, um, we'll do that as well. But but feel free to contact me at any time. There's my two phone numbers. The cell phone number is actually my old Alaska cell. Um, it, that is does have text message capabilities, although we're being asked by the university not to text message with our students. And so I guess I'm supposed to discourage you from texting me, uh, but you can phone me. And, and the other number is my home phone number. I, I uh, live by myself along with my Husky who, uh, you know, does, isn't interested in the phone call. So you can leave messages on the answering machine at home or leave uh, messages on my voicemail on my cell. I will generally try to get back to you on, on uh, phone calls. Well, as soon as I get the message or within 24 hours, if you email me at either of those two addresses here, uh, I, I will re try to respond to you within 48 hours on the outside. Um, f quite frankly, I check my Comcast email much more uh, frequently than I do my university email address, but um, I, I do check my email address at the university as well on a regular basis. The university prefers that we communicate through the alaska.edu address, but again, my comcast.net address is private. Uh, no one else reads the emails there, so you should feel free to contact me, whichever one you want. Um, in addition to the um, years of experience that I have in, in, in working in various settings in social work. Um, I have also done a lot of volunteer work. I, I, vol I was a volunteer big brother in both in Michigan and in Florida for a number of years with, with some uh, different boys that were with, that didn't have fathers in their lives. And um, also hosted uh, several foreign, ex nine different foreign exchange students over the years. 
uh, for the for the pretty much a year each of them uh, from all over Europe and one from China as well and uh, and was a volunteer uh, what they called a, an area representative for for the um, the exchange program school youth for understanding or YFU I was an area rep for them for a number of years also and so I worked with children really from many many different locations all around the globe uh, and and that has been a great experience in terms of broadening my own horizons and understanding of of the power that cultures have in our lives as well so in any event um, I bring a lot of different kinds of ideas and experiences to to this work most of my f focus has been on um, children and families as you'll see um, and and uh, 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 family violence has also been an area that has been some of, of some focus of mine, of course, in my career. I worked a lot with uh, both sexual abuse victims as well as sex offenders uh, formally in treatment programs as well, uh, both in group and individual basis. And so I bring a number of different, uh, a ne a number of different uh, ideas to, to this uh, class, and I hope it will be helpful to you as we work through the material during the semester. Uh, first, a little bit about the books that we're going to be working out of this semester. This textbook uh, by Morley Glicken is, um, you know, getting, it's only in its second edition. I've been waiting for uh, Professor Glicken to come out with a third edition uh, written to him. I haven't heard back from him. I'd like to know if he's going to bring out a new edition or not. It still uh, presents very timely information, though, although it does, it is now, I think, seven or eight years old. Um, and what I like about this book is, is that it gives you uh, an exposure to the broad array of fields of practice that social workers find themselves in. And that's one of the things that I really like about this profession. If, if, um, if you're working in a particular area and you begin to feel a little tired of the work or burned out or it's not challenging you or it's too challenging, whatever it might be, there are so many different other areas that you can put your your education to use and your experience to use in this field and so um, this this uh, this really is a great introduction to all the different areas of, of practices you might find yourself in and what some of the issues are for the workers in each of those areas um, my dad uh, grew up during the Great Depression he, he uh, well, actually, he grew up before the Great Depression but he was a young man during the Great Depression but was working for the um, U.S. Postal Service and managed to keep his job and to have a steady income all through the Depression, you know, when people all around him were losing their work. And and he uh, worked for the Postal Service all the way through to his retirement in his early 60s. So he retired with, uh, you know, in those days, uh, postal employees had a pretty decent retirement program and, you know, was was well taken care of, I think, by, by uh, his pension uh, in his retirement and his I was the youngest of five boys in his family and and uh, I remember him telling me before I left for school that you know you get a job you keep that job you stay with that employer show show devotion to your employer your employer is going to take care of you so that when you retire you know you'll be you'll be well taken care of and you know one of the first things that uh, I learned in social work was no you want to move around you want to you want to uh, you don't want to be in one job too long because you can become uh, very burned out uh, very very uh, narrow narrowly focused in fact and and uh, it, one way to keep yourself fresh in the field is to move around a bit and every now and then you know get another job now that doesn't mean just hop through the jobs uh, every year but but uh, you know after you've worked in the field for a while if you feel like it's time to to look for another area it's okay for you to uh, you know to look for some other area to use your skills in although you may land in a job as I did where you find you really have found your field of practice for myself children and families is sort of the the core of all of my positions and and my career while I did uh, change employers and change positions during the course of my career um, Children and families was sort of the unifying thing through all of that. So while I was keeping my perspective fresh, I was also building my uh, my expertise, let's say, in those areas so that, uh, you know, I had something to really give back in the later years of my profession, of my work. So anyway, Glicken will, uh, will introduce you to a lot of those things. Now, I will tell you... Um, 
the it is an introductory text and there are areas where uh, I think Glicken could go into more detail than he does and uh, uh, it really is more about the particular job and less about how you work with people and we're going to take care of that issue with the other book in a second I'll tell you about that but but it does tell you what kinds of issues you're going to be exposed to in in so many different areas uh, of the work that we that we do Glicken also has some very helpful perspectives on on uh, what we do and why we do what we do some of it may surprise you a little bit he he has a kind of a raised eyebrow about some of the things the social workers do and believe and um, it's just something good for you to think about as you read and and you work on your discussion boards um, with with your classmates now the text that I think kind of if, if Glicken kind of gives you the uh, the intellectual part of the social work field, let's say, and exposure to all those things. Um, this book, it, although Joanne Levine, I don't believe is a social worker, the original author of this book, Naomi Bray was, and this book really talks more about the heart of what we do and how we work with people, um, the kinds of skills we need to have, the kind of listening skills and, and uh, approaches that we need to take that will be useful to our clients. And so, we'll be reading this book is much smaller than the, the Glicken text and we'll be reading these chapters and weaving them through our lessons uh, throughout the semester and I think you'll find that uh, Levine's book is something that's really very helpful in, in addressing the kinds of, uh, of communication skills that we have to have um, and our, uh, interpersonal skills we need to employ in order to help our clients on, on a human level. It's a very, very good book in that respect. So these are the two books we're going to be working out of this semester. Um, the, you find the course syllabus in, in Blackboard. I hope you found it by now. It, it's, it is at near the top of your course menu in Blackboard. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to read through this uh, syllabus. Read all of it. If you have questions, write those questions down and please contact me. You know, you can email me uh, if you need to or, or telephone me if you have a question that needs a, a, a more rapid response. Uh, but please make sure you work through the syllabus. It's your responsibility to know what's in it. Now, the syllabus may change a little bit as the semester goes along. Not much, but it may a little bit. And if there are any changes made to the syllabus, they'll be posted in um in Blackboard, and, and uh, I will uh, I will make note of whatever changes are made and the date they're made uh, in in the uh, syllabus menu item. But uh, again, I don't expect too many too many changes there. And what you're seeing here pretty much is uh, what we'll have during the semester. Uh, there are grading elements, and I'm going to go through each of these uh, one by one. So I'm not going to go through this list too closely right now, but there are several different grading elements that will help determine your grade. Now, one thing I want to tell you, Blackboard's um, grade book has a way of of uh, telling you you're not doing as well as you really are. And uh, I don't know, um, not really sure how the grade book works for you all, but I know every now and then students contact me because they say Blackboard is telling them they're carrying a D in the class when they're really doing A work. And, and that has something to do with, I think, percentages and things like this. Um, what I want to tell you is um, Blackboard doesn't necessarily know what you've already been assigned and what you haven't, I think. And sometimes they, they factor in work that you haven't been able to do yet. In, in figuring your percentage. Also, Blackboard doesn't understand, or else I don't understand how to use the grade, the grade book, uh, the, the uh, extra, uh, extra points, the uh, extra credit points. And so they'll tell you you're getting a zero if you don't do an extra credit project, which, you know, for many people, seems like it's an F. And it's not. It just means you don't get any points for that particular project if you didn't do it but it's extra credit so it's it's not going to count against your percentage uh, but blackboard doesn't doesn't understand that so what i'm telling you is just know how many points you could have earned figure out how many points you have earned and then work out the percentage and you'll know what your grade is based on that and here here are you know the grading uh scale is is up uh, this says uh 670 points and actually now it's 700 points i I thought I fixed all this. There's always something I miss. Uh, I should say 700 points total, and and um, it's a pretty standard uh, grading scale throughout the university there. So it's the points you've earned 
divided by the points you could have earned and that will give you your percentage oops so one way you're going to earn points is through participation and attendance and uh, blackboard tells me when you log in I can I can uh, more or less track the kinds of things you've done or haven't done, um, but but uh, really what I'm I'm going to be more looking at is is you know are you regularly participating in all the activities in the class, uh, are you participating in your group project and are you being available to your to your uh, fellow group members regularly there, um, are are you um, participating fully or are you just kind of responding every now and then to things without really in like in discussion boards for instance not really getting into the discussion but just kind of you know putting up a response and leaving it those kinds of things these are the kinds of things that are going to um, determine how many points you get out of these 50 partic for participation and attendance if you if you um, if you do all of the projects and and you participate in them fully you're going to get 50 points. Now, discussion boards. Um, I think if you haven't worked in discussion boards before, uh, it may be a little mystifying at first, but it, it they're pretty intuitive and pretty user friendly. Uh, if if you aren't sure what to do about discussion boards, please let me know, and uh, maybe we can you know get into uh, on a collaborate session or something in Blackboard, and I can help walk you through how to how to do discussion boards. Some I don't know quite how we do this, but I'm I'm certainly willing to help you with this. But most of you probably have done discussion boards before, and so each week uh, when you go through the course content, and I'll tell you how to get there in a, in a little while, uh, you're going to find your discussion board question. I'm going to give you a question every week to respond to and then your response is to be written out uh, 150 words or more at least 150 words and that's not a lot of words that's a short paragraph really but 150 words or more your initial response and then later on you go back and read your classmates responses and respond to at least two of them those responses do not have to be 150 words uh, in length, but they do need to be something meaningful. They shouldn't be just saying, yeah, I agree, or no, I don't agree. But, you know, you should, you should have something to say about what your classmates said to add to it. Uh, if you disagree a little bit about maybe why, how you see things, or if you agree, you know, adding to what your, what your classmate is saying. So the responses should be something fairly substantial. Again, I'm not so much looking for length in the responses as I'm looking for something that is a meaningful response. So you in each discussion board, then um, you're going to have it assigned, let's say, on Sunday, February 3rd, which is like week three or week four. You'll have a week to put in your original response of 150 words or more. That's so that you would have that in there by February the 10th. And then by Thursday following that day, or really at any time, but no later than then, you should have gone back in and have read at least two, at least two of your uh, classmates responses and I encourage you to read more than that and and respond to them as though you were discussing what they said okay um, and you should have those two responses in at least two responses in uh, by Thursday that the second Thursday so that would now be 11 days after the original question opened and then the weekend following that is when I'm probably going to go in and grade it so so, you know, you, it's going to be a couple of weeks before you get the grade once once the discussion board is posted, but you can see why that is. So your original response plus two responses to classmates posts get you 10 points each week if you do it fully. Now, uh, th th this is a public post, meaning that everybody in the class can read what you, of course, including me, can read uh, what you wrote. So, of course, well, just keep that in mind. You know, you want to keep it respectful and polite and those kinds of things. And by the way, in your discussion board posts, I don't want to see any, this is not chat. So no uh, LMAOs or LOLs or uh, chat shortcuts. This is, these are, this is professional communication. This is college communication. And so type out your words no no uh we're not using emojis <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not using uh we're not using um, chat lingo or anything like this this is uh, an, uh, a college level discussion and and so please be sure to use proper english in these in these responses 
And every now and then there's going to be a second discussion board. I think it's three times during the semester where you can get those extra credit points if you want them just by, you know, another 10 points by, by responding to two discussions instead of just one. Now, there's the next thing you have is, is uh, what we call our journals or the, the weekly e-scrapbook. Uh, in the olden days, when I, when I did this class in the classroom, students literally were putting together a scrapbook. They were clipping articles from the paper and from magazines and getting things off the web and literally putting them into a scrapbook and turning that in at the end of the semester. All the issues of, you know, that came up about social welfare and human rights and equal rights and oppression and, you know, all those kinds of social work issues during the semester. And they got great on that. Well, you're not doing that here. So what we're doing is what I call an e-scrapbook. And what you're going to do here, this is your current events issue. The idea with this is uh, to, to uh, be sure you're aware of how what you're studying connects with what's going on around you in the world because there are all sorts of social work, social welfare, human rights, civil rights issues all the time in the paper and in the news and in magazines and on the web. And um, so, so be looking at those things and uh, what you're going to do is select one of those studies, those stories, one of those topics, and, and write a brief summary in your journal of what the topic was, what the news issue was, and then a, a separate paragraph with a response to that, your reaction to that of 150 words or more. Um, now this post, unlike the discussion board, is just between you and me. And so again, you're going to get 10 points for this, um, but it should be done every week. Now that's the thing. So so um, this is just between you and me, and, and although in the discussion board, I, I consider the discussion board something that's mostly between you and your classmates, so while I'll chime in occasionally on those discussion boards, you're not going to see me posting things in discussion boards much. I'm reading them, and I'm grading them, but, but I'm not always going to be writing in them. But in your journals, my goal is to try to respond to every journal post that you make so so this is sort of like your opportunity to get a hold of me by the arm and say hey I got something I want to tell you about or something I want to ask you about you know now sometimes students use the journal because it's more private to be a little more upfront about their feelings about things and a little more honest about stuff than they might or they may get into more personal issues uh, in the journal than they would in the discussion board because it is just between you and me and that's quite okay you know uh, so again, just think of it as though you are grabbing me by the arm and say, can I tell you something? I talk to you privately for a minute. I want to tell you something, that kind of thing. That's, that's your journal opportunity here. So, uh, now I, I, I'm teaching, you know, somewhere between three and four classes a semester and there are journal articles in several of those classes, journal requirements. And so understand that while I say I'm going to respond personally each week, uh, it's going to be hard for me to get into in depth in these and there may be even a few weeks here and there where I can't respond personally um, you know because it gets to be you know it's a lot of journal responses to to, to make but um, um, I, I will try my best to do that and, and um, again know that I'm reading everything it's supposed to whether you get a personal response from me or not so 10 points for your journal articles each week uh, and 10 points for your discussion boards each week up to that amount that's 20 points a week for those two that's 280 points during the semester now, how to write your discussion board in your journal posts, uh, there, go to your course menu. Well, first of all, this week's uh, course content, there's a slide that says how your posts will earn points. But, but outside of that, there's also a, a menu item called board and journal grading guidelines, and that explains how I grade those things fully. So please do read through that so that you know how to get as, your maximum points. Uh, particularly in regards to the journal, there is an excellent example of how I want the journals to be to be written up okay and so look at that example and try to fashion your journal entries around that example and and you're likely to get your full credit for those each time the big project during the semester is the term group research project and so in this and and this is a pretty large class this semester so the groups are going to probably all have um, four to five people assigned and you're going to be assigned to study a minority group uh, as sort of a diversity studies kind of a issue. So you you may be assigned to the study of Muslim American 
or of African Americans or Native Americans or Alaska Natives or women or, or gay and lesbians, whatever it might be. So you're going to be assigned to a particular group and your group is going to have to divide that topic up among the four of you or five of you or three of you, however many wind up being there. Um, and then you will together present one paper to me at the end. And um, that paper is uh, going to be about 15 pages altogether. It's about a 5,000 word project. And if you look in the syllabus, there's a, there's a, again, a pretty thorough description of, of this project in the syllabus. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You're going to be given a workspace uh, in, it's going to, I think it's called your project group on the course menu. You can't see it yet, but when I assign these groups, probably around week three or week four, um, then, then uh, you and your fellow group members only will be able to get you into your group site and me. I, I can look into all the group sites, but the rest of the class uh, can't get into your group site. Only you will be able to do that. I do assign these groups randomly um, uh, for a number of different reasons. So no, I can't assign you to a group with your best friend or anything like that. It might happen accidentally. Uh, and um, and uh, you're also the topic, again, is, is something that will be just kind of randomly assigned to you. Now, group work, this is this in many respects may be the most challenging part of the class. And um, if you've never done a group project online before, uh, you're going to do it now. And, and you're going to find out that it's very, very possible. Um, a lot of groups, uh, particularly those that are, you know, if everybody kind of like, say, lives in Anchorage, you know, they choose to get together occasionally and, you know, sit down at Starbucks or something like that and, you know, and meet occasionally. And that's all well and good. But you have a group site in there and I need to know that you're working together. And so I'm going to be looking in the group site for signs that you are communicating with your fellow group members. You'll have different tools in your group site like discussion boards and file exchanges and things like this where you can communicate and exchange information. And so, and I'm going to tell you about this in a minute, but I'm going to be checking in and you'll be graded on whether or not I see a presence of, of you working in your group's site. And there's a reason for that. I'll get to that in a second. The other thing is, is that there are procrastinators. There are obsessive compulsives and the OCD people want to get everything done right away. The procrastinator is like, we'll wait to the night before and then try to get something turned out. You know, this is a group project. This means you have to work together and you have to coordinate your work together. And that means that the OCD people have to learn to be patient with the procrastinators, but the procrastinators need to get off their butt and get things done sooner. OK, because you drive everybody else crazy and you keep everybody dangling on a string waiting for you to get around to getting to the, the work. That's not OK in this project. And so one of the things that I've learned to do over the many years of doing the online teaching now is to require that you turn in your written portion of your project to your group in your group's file exchange no later than a week before the project's due date. So if the project is due, say, April 4th or whatever it is, then by March 28th, everybody is to have their written portion turned into the group. And then however you've decided to divvy this up, whoever it is that's coordinating all this and putting it together will have, you know, at least a week to get everything put together. This is supposed to be one paper. I don't want three, four, or five papers put together back to back. I want one paper. So that means information has to be combined and edited, you know, it, with some consistency. Keep this in mind, okay? Don't drive your group crazy. Keep working on it steadily. Uh, course syllabus has information about this. And also when, when your group project is assigned, another uh, menu item is going to uh, come up as uh, group guidelines and um, grading elements or whatever that um, uh, will, will make all this real clear as to how it is that you know you to do this and what the expectations are for the paper. So these group check-ins that I was telling you about where I want to see that you're communicating with your group at least twice during the semester and I'll give you the dates uh, when I assign the, the project when I'm going to go in and look for your contributions for your presence in your group site in Blackboard. Now, if you're working in Google Groups, that's fine, uh, you know, or wherever Google, uh, 
you know, I forget what you call it, uh, Google Apps or whatever. Uh, or if you're meeting at Starbucks or whatever, that's great. You know, it's, it's all well and good. Maybe not everybody can do that in your group. Keep that in mind. But, but also remember, the only way I can grade that I know you're doing this is by seeing your presence in your group's project site in Blackboard. And so you have to leave a footprint in there for me to know that you're working on things. Um, and that's each, each group check-in is going to be worth 20 points. The group paper, by the way, um, let me, I'm going backwards here, is 150 points altogether. So you see that's a, it's a big deal. And, and uh, you get this grade together. So that's the other thing. This is a group and social workers work in groups all the time. And uh, the, there are people who are organizers and there are people who are kind of loafers, you know, and the organizers going to keep the loafers working. And this is really up to the group to make sure this works. Now, if you have somebody who just isn't contributing, uh, you need to let me know about this. Don't wait until the last minute to tell me. But, but first, as a group, it's your responsibility to try to engage that person with you. So write to that person, call that person. Um, be sure that everybody has each other's phone numbers and text numbers. And, and, and if you have then tried and, and that person's not responding, uh, then write to me and tell me about it and copy that person also. Uh, the group should know you're doing that, including that person. And, and then I will, I may tell you to go back and try a little more, or I may try to reach out to that person myself. I do reserve the right to remove people from groups or to reduce the points for individuals <clears throat> if they're late or they're not contributing or whatever. So keep it in mind. Don't wait to the last minute to deal with a problem person though. After you finish your paper, I like to mark up papers, you know, tell, you know, I like this, you know, and circle things and make comments in the margins. I will then uh, upload that paper back to your group's uh, file exchange so that you can read it there and print out and make a copy of it if you want as well with all my comments on it. I will also take your group paper and post a clean copy in a discussion board forum. And at the end of the semester, uh, that forum will be open the last three or four weeks. It's called Peer Reviews, and you'll read each other's papers, and you'll participate in discussion board forums, discussion boards about each of those papers. So your paper is that your research will be shared with your classmates, and you'll get an opportunity to learn from what your classmates uh, researched also. So it's a great, great opportunity to learn about all of these issues and uh, expand your knowledge quite a bit and learn from each other. Two tests during the semester. Uh, if you're taking 106 with me this semester, you may notice that there's a difference in the scoring for these, and that's because uh, you don't, there, 106 uh, students have an extra project, a, 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 a short paper on a book that you're not doing here. So what I've done is I've, I've upped the number of points in 206 uh, for the test. So your first test is worth 50 points, the second is worth 80 points. They're multiple choice questions. Um, each so there's 50 questions in the first one 80 in the second yes the 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 eight the uh, test two is a final and will be comprehensive throughout the semester so um these these uh, questions come from test banks that the publishers give me so um, anyway that's where these questions come from now the way this works you don't have to go to the testing center you do this right at your computer you'll take the test right in blackboard in fact so that um you know in in the week I think it's week seven and week 15 when the two tests open up on Thursdays of that week, the test opens up and you, you just click on it and it'll open up and you can answer the questions. And if you want, you can get your, your score right away. Um, you have 11 days to take the test so that Thursday of the week, uh, week seven and Thursday of week 15, the tests open and then the tests stay open until two Sunday nights later uh, when the test then closes. And after that time, you can no longer take the test. So you have 11 days to get in there to take the test. If you don't like your first score, you can go back in and take it a second time and try to get a better score. Your questions are going to be different. Um, it's all coming from the same material, but the tests are random. So that if you're sitting in a computer and somebody in the class is sitting next to you, even taking the test at the same time, you'll have different tests. All right, because the, te the questions are randomized and you might see a few questions of the same in your second attempt, but, but many of the others are going to be entirely different. But you can take it a second time to try to get a better score. The higher of the two scores is the one that will be recorded in your, in your um, test center, in your um, grade center. So try to make them as user friendly as possible. Um, 
so 130 points total altogether for that. Again, this is explained in the syllabus. Don't miss the closing date because when the closing date has passed, the test will no longer be available and you'll forfeit those points. Additional discussion boards, I think three different times. There may actually be a, a, a fourth discussion board because there's one, I think we have discussion boards in 15 weeks and yet I, I only have 14 weeks in the grading um, setup or whatever. So you actually have, there's like 40 different, 40 extra points in there altogether. And I would tell you, by the way, um, do do the second discussion boards, even if you're thinking, I don't know if I would really bother with it, because later in the semester, you're going to want those points. And, and I'm I, uh, not likely to go back and give you credit for them late in the semester. If you, you know, if you're a little late entering your discussion boards and or journals, uh, you know, that might be okay if it's not too late. But once the discussion is over, I mean, you know, after the, a week or so, the discussion is kind of dead in every topic and the classes move on to another one. And so you might go in a few weeks later and make some comments, um, but they're just comments. They're not really contributing to the discussion. So you're going to get less points for that. You're going to get full points only when you're current with the discussion boards and current with your journals. Okay. When you open Blackboard, you'll notice uh, it opens to the announcements page. Always check the new announcements should be on top. The old announcements will stay below them, but the new announcements should be on top. And uh, you should be getting emails every time I post an announcement. And if you don't, there's something wrong with the university email account. So check in with, with IT about that. Um, but, but you'll be getting emails for all these announcements, but always check to make sure there isn't one you missed. This is sort of like when I stand up in front of the class and say, before we get started, I have something I need to share with you. This is what I always tell people in this. Uh, you might have heard the same thing in, in, uh, in my 106 lecture as well, if you're taking that class. Weekly course content is the most important link in the class because this is where really the class is and so uh, Sunday morning on each week Sunday morning early early Sunday morning a new learning unit opens up for the week and so on Sunday go in and you'll see there work through all the slides and you'll see what the assignments are what you're supposed to read you'll find your discussion board question you'll find you know a place for you to enter your journal if there's a test you'll see where the test will be those kinds of things be sure you read each slide every week to the end and this is pretty much what you're going to find in content at least this much every week so an opening slide learning objectives for the week which tells you what it is you're supposed to gain from uh, from the course material this week your reading assignments or other activities that you have for the week um, your recorded course lectures, somewhere between two to four of them. Now, I could put them all in one lecture, but you'd be sitting there for about two and a half hours listening to me. Uh, some weeks a little longer, some weeks a little less. And so they're broken up into shorter units. But, uh, but you know, you're going to find pretty much somewhere between one and a half to two and a half hours worth of lectures each week there. You really do need to listen to them. I, I really encourage you to, to listen, take the time to listen to them. This is, this is really what it amounts to is when you, your class time with me, when I'm talking with you about what's going on. The only thing is, is you're not going to get a chance to say, uh, interrupt me with questions, but you can email me with questions if they come up while, while the lectures are going on. After that, after you've done the readings and you've and you've uh, listened to the lectures then go in and do your discussion board uh, response there's your journal link is next um, as you work through your um, blackboard course there's a little button up in the right hand side that says next as you go from one slide to the next but when you go into discussion boards you come out of that system and so to get back into the blackboard course you have to click your back button on your browser that is your browser back button to get back out of the discussion boards back into the class uh, same thing I think for the journal link as well I don't know why that is but that's just the way it is you don't have that little next button up there in the right I will have uh, PDF versions of the lecture slides for you if you want to keep them for 
you know, for studying or whatever. And you'll be able to go back later on and, you know, into previous weeks if you want to, to look at them again. And then the closing slide. And the opening and closing slides are things that I write up for you. I hope you read them. They're my, my, you know, the opening slide is really kind of telling you this is what I want you to be thinking about as you go through this material. And the closing slide is this is kind of once I'm hoping you can draw from some of this, and, you know, that kind of thing. And then other slides are going to be there. Your tests will be in there when, when the tests come up. There will be the course evaluations, and I occasionally will throw in a few other things as well. Now, if you've, uh, this is something I always tell my classes, but, and I think I put this in my introductory email as well. Keep in mind, this isn't a correspondence course where you can just wait till the end of the semester to turn in all your work. You have to do this. You have, because we don't have a class meeting, this is entirely asynchronous. You know, you have the entire week to do this stuff whenever you feel like during the week. But if you don't do it within the week, you're going to be in trouble. So, uh, because you're not going to be able to keep up. Teach yourself that Monday or Sunday morning is when the class opens, the class unit opens, and Saturday night is the end of class, and everything that's to get done, with the exception of the responses to classmates' discussion board posts, which have to take a little longer, but everything else, uh, you know, you want to get done during that week. Your discussion boards, your readings, the lectures, all of that stuff within the week, within the week. i say it again within the week that's your flexibility not for a month <laughs> or not for the semester do it within every week that's your time frame and that's where your flexibility is every sunday morning a new learning unit is going to open up for that for that week so be get in the habit of checking on sunday morning to see what you have to do during the week and then you'll be fine I don't think I have to tell you much about this anymore. People my age, uh, we didn't have computers when we were in college. I can still remember going to back to East Lansing and going into the bookstore in the mid '80s, and with my uh, my oldest boy and and looking in the bookstores and seeing personal computers on the walls for sale. You know, for and I'm thinking, God, they have computers in their in their dorm rooms now, and you know. Uh, my, uh, I had a roommate who was taking a computer programming class. He had to walk a mile across campus to the computer. <laughs> I know that seems like it was a long time ago. That was in the mid '70s. Things have changed a lot uh, since since we were we were uh, young college students, and um, we've had to learn how, what you know some of the ins and the outs of communicating over the internet. Uh, are I I have come to understand these things I think and most of us have by now but for those of you that might not be familiar there are certain things you need to keep in mind you know one of them is is that there's a human being at the other end of of uh, that little wire that leads into the wall from your computer and when they read what you write they're going to be personally affected by what they read so that means, you know, and, and they can't tell if you're being sarcastic. They can't tell if you're joking. You know, you don't, they don't hear the tone of voice. They don't see your facial expression. You know, they don't, can't read your body language, all those kinds of things. And so understand it's only your written word that, that goes, that gets, that gets communicated. So just keep that in mind when you write, write carefully, write respectfully. Don't ever attack other people. This is the same thing as if you were in a classroom. You know, uh, if you have a difference of opinion about an idea, it's about an idea. It's not about the person. Boy, that is the thing that's going on in social media these days. You know, people are slamming each other with, with their ideas. And if you don't agree with them, they're unfriending you and all those kinds of things. You know, that's crazy. That's just crazy. You know, if we don't agree, we don't agree. But we can discuss these things together and, and uh, be respectful of each other and and try to learn from each other about where we're coming from you know so so that's all about netiquette you know so please keep in mind that that uh, practice some basic rules of courtesy uh, and and we'll be fine and, and and try to be forgiving of other people when if they say some things that are a little offensive or a little uh, ignorant sometimes you know if it becomes a, a perpetual problem and I, especially if I'm not catching it please do bring it to my attention um, uh, Title IX, notwithstanding, I mean, you know, there are uh, forms of sexual harassment, sexual um, exploitation, uh, sexual suggestiveness, inappropriateness, those kinds of things. Um, 
you know, you, you have a right to be protected from those things. And, uh, you know, if you want, uh, please do bring them to my attention. I can uh, refer you to the proper persons on campus or refer, you know, if there's a, especially if there's egregious violations, uh, you know, refer to the right people on campus to deal with it. But, um, but again, I, you know, I don't run into this in social work courses and I don't expect I'll do that here. Uh, but just know that, uh, you know, I'm here to, to, to help you with that if it happens, but please try to be courteous of each other in all respects. This week's discussion board, you'll find in, in the course content a little further, a little few more pages down. And what we're going to be doing is asking you to talk a little bit about yourself. Let's introduce ourselves to each other. Um, share what you're comfortable with, uh, uh, maybe what brought you here to the class. I mean, here's a number of different things you might you might respond to or think about, but don't don't limit yourself to these questions. I encourage you to include pictures if you're comfortable with that. It just sometimes it's nice to have a face with a name, but uh, it doesn't have to be your your face either. It could be your pets. It could be, you know, some places you've been or something like that or some picture you really like. But And, and not only this, but any discussion boards, you know, sometimes uh, photographs and, you know, arts and things like that kind of make the discussion boards a little more interesting. So feel free to, to post some photos too. You don't have a journal um, the first week. You won't have a journal but in the week two, you'll be your first journal entry. Uh, and so take the week to look for current events related to social work, civil rights, or other social work related issues. Now, I am going to be asking you to focus on social work related issues. I know, you know, but, but that can be pretty broad. And, and, you know, you see here, social programming, the budget, education, civil rights, racism, sexism, health care reform, immigration, same-sex marriage, gay rights, the wall, you know, all those kinds of things. You know, um, these are all things that that um, you know are fair game for for your journal articles, and there's a lot more as well. So keep that in mind. I may try to help you get uh, you know uh, focused a little better in proper areas if you get off track. But uh, these are the things. Remember a brief summary of the article. Please uh, give me the title of the article or the the topic, uh, where you're drawing, what source you're using so that I can go back and look at it if I want to. Um, so, so, you know, like, and again, you know, there's a great, a great example of this in, in board and journal grading guidelines. Please do look at that. You'll see how to write these journal articles up. Um, and then a brief summary of, of what the news article is and what your reaction is 150 words or more for that reaction. So here's a quote from Albert Schweitzer, who was, uh, <laughs> I always forget what he was, but he was a, he's a philosopher, somebody who, he was a doctor, as I recall, who spent a lot of time in, well, he was European, um, but spent a lot of time in Africa, uh, starting up hospitals, I believe, in very, very poor areas. And uh, he, he just was one of these guys that had his fingers in all different kinds of sciences and was well-respected around the world. And he said... The final decision as to what the future of a society shall be depends not on how near its organization is to perfection, but on the degrees of worthiness of its individual members. This tells me it's really up to us. It's the people in a society that make a difference in what we do. And, and, and coming to social work tells me that, or looking at social work at least, tells me that you may have a hint that this is true. So welcome to the class. Please let me know if you have questions, and otherwise, onward. You'll hear more from me next week. Thanks.